sculptors and painters. But it was painting that would become the ultimate expression of creative genius at the Vatican. During the Renaissance, the walls and ceilings of the entire Vatican became one vast canvas, a canvas on which great artists came to paint from throughout Italy and the whole of Europe as well. So if you were talented and you were singled out to be an apprentice, become an artist, you naturally got a commission from the church. And the Vatican, St. Peter's, was big time. The biggest time. The luck of the game is that, indeed, the Vatican is in Italy. Italy. <laughs> There's one unending series of artistic genius. These people would pour in because that's where the excitement was. And we have to remember that a creative person, it's not the money, it's not the living wage, it's not even, you know, rushing up to the Pope. It's doing it. It's seeing your great idea. That's it. The painter Raphael was commissioned by the warrior pope Julius II to cover the walls of his quarters with a series of elaborate frescoes. Raphael's frescoes celebrate the culture of ancient Greece, the greatness of Pope Julius, and the triumph of Christianity. His crowning achievement, unfinished at his death, was this painting of the Transfiguration of Christ. The only artist to surpass Raphael in artistic glory and papal favor was Michelangelo. Nearly 50 years before he stepped in to save St. Peter's Basilica, Michelangelo had burst upon the Vatican scene like lightning. At the age of 24, he carved a dazzling statue of a broken-hearted mother, the Pietà. The Pietà made Michelangelo's reputation, both as a sculptor and as a fierce individualist. This very conspicuous work drew people's admiration, but no one really was sure who had done it. The work was as yet unsigned, and rumors began to run that one or another of the relatively few practicing marble sculptors in Rome had created it. The young Florentine, unwilling to let anyone else take credit, paid a sacristan to allow him back into St. Peter's Basilica at night when, by lantern light and in privacy so that no one would see him, he carved his name and his nationality across the band that crosses Mary's breast. Michelangelo Bonarotti, the Florentine, because he wanted his name to be known and he wanted it to be known that he was a Florentine. The chisel had brought Michelangelo fame. The paintbrush would earn him immortality. In the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo would create the crown jewel in the Vatican's art collection. The chapel, tucked between the Papal Palace and St. Peter's Basilica, looks plain from the outside. Michelangelo called it a barn. But inside, it was anything but plain. The walls of the chapel were adorned with dazzling frescoes by Raphael, Botticelli, and other famous painters. Pope Julius asked Michelangelo to make its ceiling just as beautiful. Michelangelo's answer set off a titanic struggle of wills. Michelangelo said no. Julius asks Michelangelo to switch over, to move from sculpture to painting. We know that Michelangelo felt inadequate to the task and offended by the change in plan. Michelangelo resisted the commission, bitterly complained, tried to get away, ultimately accepted it because the Pope left him not one square inch of leeway in which to escape the task assigned. You have to remember that Michelangelo was on the job training when he did the Sistine ceiling. He had never done a fresco in his life. He was learning as he went along. And a lot of his sufferings, because it's well written about, the paint dropping on him, the agony of his back, the aching neck, real pain, comes because he was frustrated. He really wasn't getting it at first. 
For four solitary, doubt-filled years during his 30s, Michelangelo turned his gaze upward. Gradually, he filled the ceiling with dramatic figures, 340 in all, embodying the major events of the Old Testament. He feared the frescoes would ruin his reputation. Instead, they took it to new heights. Michelangelo's greatness, in a sense, in the ceiling and perhaps in life, is that he took a situation that did not appeal to him, to which he felt inadequate, a situation in which he really wanted to be doing something else, and transformed it by genius and by anger. Michelangelo, in the uh, Sistine Chapel ceiling, creates the most dramatic, the most powerful uh, image of the interaction of man and God. You enter under scenes which speak of human sinfulness. And as you move toward the altar, the figures become more powerful, God becomes grander and more impressive, and you have this overwhelming uh, feeling that uh, God is indeed the source of all power and that that God is good, and that if mankind sinned, this is the very place where God offers pardon. The ceiling frescoes were such a success that 30 years later, in his 60s, Michelangelo was brought back to paint one final fresco, the Last Judgment, whose terrible beauty fills the great wall above the chapel's altar. Today, nearly 500 years after their creation, Michelangelo's powerful frescoes still dazzle the eye and uplift the soul. But the Sistine Chapel is far more than just a showcase of Renaissance art. It is also the site of the Vatican's most solemn and important event, the election of every new pope. Secret discussions and momentous decisions that alter the life of the Vatican and change the course of world history.